morning, everybody. Happy Mother's Day. I've been so incredibly blessed at the mothers who have been in my life. I know for sure that if there's three people praying for our church and praying th- for me throughout the week, it's my wife, the mother of my children, it's my own mom, and it's my mother-in-law. So I know for sure that those three people every week are praying for our church and are praying for us. So for all you mothers, happy Mother's Day. I hope you have a a wonderful day today. I think it's providential that on Mother's Day, we're gonna be studying 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 through 11. The title of this morning's message is The Commandment to Love. Many times mothers exemplify love towards their children better than any other example that we see this on a regular basis. Mothers will often go to extraordinary lengths to protect their children. A good mother's love is self-denying. It's often sacrificial. And a good mother's love is built out of a genuine love and care and a commitment to her child. As I read a story this week about a mother and her son, I thought it would be a good example to share this morning. I think it'll get us thinking about what love is. The story is about Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison is probably the greatest inventor who ever lived. He he would invent things like the modern light bulb and the phonograph, and he even was the inventor of the motion picture. But long, long before Thomas Edison was considered one of the greatest geniuses who ever lived, he came home from school as a young boy, and he had a paper that he was supposed to give to his mother. He told her, my teacher gave me this. And she told me that I was only supposed to give it to you. So his mother opened up the envelope and her eyes were tearful. And she read the letter out loud to her child. She read this to Thomas. Your son is a genius. This school is too small for him and doesn't have enough good teachers to train him. Please teach him yourself. So from that point forward, Thomas Edison's mother devoted her life to teaching Thomas. She would go to great lengths to educate him. She educated him to the fullest extent of her abilities. She would devote so much time and resources to ensure that he would receive the best education. She sacrificed her own goals. She sacrificed her own desires to train up Thomas. And in a large part, due to the love of his mother, Edison would become one of the greatest inventors who would ever live. His genius would come to fruition because of the love of his mother. But many years after her death, Thomas was at his old family home And he was going through a closet. And in the closet, he found a letter. There was a folded letter. And he opened it. And it was the letter that his teacher gave to him to give to his mother many, many years before. He opened it. And he was shocked to see what the letter actually said. The message on the letter said this, your son is mentally ill. We cannot let him attend this school anymore. He is expelled. Teach him yourself. Edison became emotional. He was stunned. He was overwhelmed at his mother's love for him. He reflected on her genuine love and care for him. She had his desire, his his best interests in mind. He reflected on her love and her sacrifice for him. And it, it has been written, Thomas Alva Edison, 
was a mentally ill child whose mother's love turned into the genius of the century. His mother was moved to action out of love for her son. And as we're going to read this morning, the Apostle John is going to be addressing this commandment to love. And this old commandment is going to be emphasized and it is preeminent. It's even described as the fulfillment of the law. This should get us thinking. Hopefully this gets us questioning. How can one command to love stand above all others? Romans 13, verses 8 through 10 says this. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is fulfilling of the law. Love is fulfilling of the law. So let's think about it this way. I like to think of things um, in practicalities. I think I'm a logical thinker, and I like to take steps to think about things. So let's think of it this way. In America, we have laws which are meant to protect children. Mothers must care for their children according to the law. Thomas Edison's mother was required by the law to care for him. It would have been against the law to neglect him, correct? We can agree. Child neglect is a serious crime. Give me a a head nod. Is, Is child neglect a serious crime? Yes. But the law was not what moved Thomas Edison's mother. It is very, very unlikely that fear of the law is what motivated her to go to the lengths that she went to educate her son. Fear of the law is rarely what brings people to provide and protect for their children. Doing the right thing is not a matter of the law. It's a matter of love. And we put these laws in place But doing the right thing most frequently is not a matter of the law. It's a matter of love. Sometimes this matter of love is a conscious, selfless decision. It's a choice. Sometimes we have to make an intentional choice when everything within our flesh doesn't want to love. When it's 3 a.m., And your baby's already been up three, four times already screaming. Out of love, you get up and you make the choice to get up and care for your child. The love of your child supersedes your exhaustion. You're not getting up and caring for your child out of fear of the law of child neglect. You're getting up because you love that child no matter how difficult the night is. There's a story that my mom tells. Sometimes it's kind of funny. I was apparently as a baby having a rough night one night and just up over and over again, and she couldn't get up anymore, so she leaned over to my dad and she said, you have to take a turn. So he gets out of bed and and goes to get me, but I, I continue to cry and cry and cry. So my mom finally gets up, and she looks at the end of the bed, And my dad had picked up the dog and was sitting there rocking the dog back and forth. And she said, just forget it. I'll take care of him. He tried. And after a long day of work, when you're mentally drained and you just want to check out, the last thing you feel like doing is helping your middle schooler with their algebra homework. You just want to tell them, listen, in the real world, there's no letters in math. Don't worry about this. But sacrificially, you help them. Not out of fear of the law, but out of love for your child. Today's text is all about the commandment to love. 
So as a starting point, I think we need a definition of love so that we know what we're talking about. So the definition of love, I hope hopefully will be put on the back wall that we're going to use today, is love is the emotion felt and actions before, performed by someone concerned for the well-being of another person. Concern for the well-being of another person. Love involves infection, compassion, care, and self-sacrifice. But we need to know this as Christians. The most important thing that you need to know about love is how God showed his love to us. You must know this to be a Christian. God sent his one and only son into the world that we might have eternal life. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and he sent his son, his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And church, when this becomes real to us, when this truth pierces our heart, it changes everything. When we understand that God so loved us that he sent his son to die for us, it moves us to love one another. We can love others because Christ loved us first. We can love others because Christ loved us first. So let's read 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 7. It says, Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, you are the creator. You are holy you are eternal. And God, you created us as image bearers. God, image bearers who are here as Christians to reflect the light of Christ. God, we're thankful for your word, your word of truth that you've given us, God. I pray that you'll give us clear minds this morning as we study your text. We see the commandment to love. God, I pray, I pray that this morning you would give us clarity about how we love others, how we love you and how we love the church. God, I pray for our time together. God, would you give us clear minds as we study your word? We pray for the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So point number one this morning, Christians obey an old commandment to love. We'll see this in verse seven. It says, Beloved, I am writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. Christians obey an old commandment to love. The old commandment John is writing about is to love. He doesn't say it directly, but that's what he's referring to. He's asking his readers to look back when the Christian gospel was first preached. The commandment to love one another should not have been a new, a new concept for them. The apostle John himself even remembered hearing this command directly from Jesus. We have to keep going back to this. John walked with Christ. And in John, the gospel of John 15, verse 12, Jesus said this, this is my commandment that you love one another as I had loved you. John remembers this. He's hearing this. And John is taking the commandment of Christ and he's now passing it on to the New Testament church. He wants to make sure that this commandment of Christ is not lost for future generations. 
John wants Christians to be looking at themselves in the mirror, evaluating whether they're loving others in a way that brings glory to Christ. Love is a test of genuine faith. Love is a test of whether you're a genuine Christian. And as we've gone through 1 John, we've seen that he's presenting to us a series of tests where you can evaluate yourself. Personally, I appreciate that John is giving us this series of tests that we can evaluate your faith against. Up until this point, John has given us three tests that we've seen in the last few weeks. Three tests of a genuine Christian. He's given us three ways we can examine ourselves when the question, am I really saved, creeps in. You've asked yourself this. I know you have. There has been times in your life when you've asked yourself, am I really saved? John is giving us markers that we should be evaluating to know, are we saved? The Apostle John knew we would struggle with this from time to time. So I think before we go into the commandment to love, I want to reiterate what the three uh, genuine questions of our faith were leading up to this point. The first test that we saw a couple weeks ago was a doctrinal test. Do you believe Christ is who he said he was? To be a Christian and be in fellowship with Christ means you ascribe a proper view of who Jesus Christ is. Do you believe that he's God? Do you believe that he is eternal? Do you believe in the virgin birth? Do you believe he walked on this earth and lived a sinless life? Do you believe in his resurrection? Do you believe that he was bodily dead and then he raised? Do you believe that? Do you believe these truths about Jesus Christ? Being a Christian requires that you hold firm to the truths about who Jesus Christ is. You cannot be a Christian and deny the truth about Christ. This is common sense. We should know this. If someone claims to be a vegetarian, but you are continually seeing them eating meat, you're going to say, stop saying you're a vegetarian. I don't care what you claim to be. Vegetarians don't eat pork. So you're eating pork that has disqualified you as a vegetarian. And likewise, If someone calls themselves a Christian but denies the proper identity of Christ, they're not a Christian. Christians must always affirm the attributes of God to Christ. So the first test of your faith is a doctrinal one. What do you believe about Jesus? Having a proper Christology is a non-negotiable for the Christian faith. And then we moved on to the second test that that John presented to us. Second test of a genuine believer is a doctrinal one as well. We talked about this two weeks ago. And it has to do with sin. How do you view your sin? Remember, the Gnostics were actually claiming that they didn't even sin. They weren't even sinners in their minds. Genuine Christians have a proper understanding of our sin. This is the second test. Genuine Christians have a proper understanding of our sin. Those who are truly saved understand that our sin is wicked and it should rightfully separate us from a holy God. A test of a true Christian is your view of your sin. How can you be saved if you don't think that your sin is a big deal? How can your sins be forgiven if you're not admitting there's sin in your life? How can you repent if you're not acknowledging your sin? The way you view your sin is a test of whether you're actually a Christian. Hear me. 
the way you view your sin is a test of actually whether you're a Christian. A denial of sin gives evidence that someone is not a genuine Christian. Minimizing, excusing, and having a nonchalant attitude about sin should bring you cause for concern about your salvation. On the other hand, confession and repentance of your sin gives evidence that you're a true believer. If you're broken over your sin, the Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin, leading you to repentance. This is evidence that you are a true believer who has been saved by God. So the first two tests were doctrinal. And then last week, Paul preached, and he moved into the first uh, moral, what we would call a moral test. And that third test of a genuine believer is obedience. Obedience is a necessary aspect of the Christian faith. Jesus was obedient even unto death. Death on the cross. That's the extent of Jesus' obedience to God the Father. And in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, Jesus says this. These are powerful words coming from our Lord Jesus. He says this. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Obedience is a serious issue. Jesus' words himself said, why do you call me Lord, but you don't do what I tell you? A person who claims to follow Christ but is not obeying Christ's commands should ask themselves, am I really a Christian? Now listen, church, this is not legalism. We need to stop entertaining that. We need to stop saying that. Pursuing holiness is not legalism. If you're believing this lie, you need to stop it. The words of Christ, Lord, Lord. You call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I tell you to do. Christ is telling us obedience is important. This is a sign of a true believer. Biblical obedience means it's an obligation and a duty to obey God. Jesus fulfilled the duty of the Father to the extent that he died on the cross. Obedience means that we submit our will and yield to the will of God. This is a test of our faith. Genuine Christian's obedience means complying with everything God commanded in the Scripture. So just to recap those, the first three tests that we saw in 1 John, the first three tests of a genuine Christian, Christian is one, a proper view of Christ. Two, a proper view of our sin. And three is obedience to the commands of Scripture. And now we're going to get to the fourth test. The fourth test of a genuine believer is love. What we saw here is this is not a new commandment. The, command, the Old Testament scriptures spoke directly to this. So Deuteronomy 6.5, we go back to the Old Testament. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your might. Leviticus 19.18 you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Christians obey an old commandment to love. These two Old Testament scriptures summarize the law. Love God and love people. Now it's easy to profess Christ without possessing Christ. Many people profess to be Christians, but that does not mean they're actually saved by Christ. Many people claim Christ, but don't be fooled. Many people are empty professors. John is telling us one of the tests of a genuine believer is their love for God and his people. Church, we must understand the difference 
between the visible church and the invisible church. These are two separate things, and, and this is where people get confused. I think there's a lot of confusion here. We have to make a distinction between the visible church and the invisible church. The visible church is the people that we see. The people who show up on Sunday mornings, the people who participate in church gatherings and practices, that's the people we see on Sunday mornings. And a good percentage of those people are believers who are sealed with the Holy Spirit. But we have to know, not everyone who attends church is saved. The visible church includes unbelievers. Now, the invisible church, the invisible church, only God knows for sure who is part of the invisible church. The invisible church is full. The invisible church is all born again believers, past, present, and future. The invisible church is comprised of every person who has ever been sealed by the Holy Spirit. So why is this important? Why is it, is it important to make a, distingu a distinguishing uh, fact between the invisible church and the visible church? Because John is using love as a means to decipher the visible church from the, the invisible church from the visible church. The distinguishing factor is love. Loving God and loving God's people have been taught throughout Scripture. Obedience to God starts with loving God. Without a love for God, there will be no obedience to God. Christians obey an old commandment to love. Love is an old commandment, but the life of Christ shed a new application on how to love. Which brings us to point number two. Christians obey a new commandment to love. This is a bit confusing. Like, how can this, how can it say it's not a, it's an old commandment, it's not a new commandment, and then the very next verse say it's a new commandment. Verse eight, at the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true of him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. John is pointing out that it all the commandment to love is not altogether new. There is a new aspect of this commandment. So what's new? What was new at the time 1 John was written that was not true in Deuteronomy and Leviticus? What was true? Anyone have an idea? Christ had walked on the earth. The New Testament people now have the example of Christ. He lived on this earth. He faced temptation, and he loved perfectly. Even in the midst of the most extreme persecution, Jesus loved perfectly. While Christ was walking in perfect obedience to God the Father, people wanted him to stumble. People tried desperately to get him to sin. They even tried to get him to contradict himself, to disqualify his witness. If you remember in the Gospel of Matthew, the Pharisees attempted to back Jesus into a doctrinal corner. They asked him to identify the, the most important commandment of the law. And this was his response, Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40. Teacher, which is the great, great commandment of the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Do you see what Jesus did there? The brilliance of Jesus, the, the sovereignty of Jesus. Do you see what he did there? He connected the Old Testament commandments of Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19 here in Matthew. Those two Old Testament scriptures that we talked to earlier, Jesus, in one quick portion, summarized them and brought them together. Jesus demands our complete love. And this is the point 
that he was making to the disciples in John 13. So let's follow the track here. We had Leviticus and we had Deuteronomy. Now I want you to follow me into John. John 13, 34 through 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The Old Testament scripture called people to love others as we loved ourselves. right? That's what the Old Testament scripture said. Love others as you've loved yourself. Now, the new twist to the old commandment. Love others as Jesus has loved you. That's a big difference. The Old Testament commandment is love God, love people as you love yourself. What Jesus is saying is, no, 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 no. You love as I have loved you. Christ is upping the stakes. It's one thing to love others like I love myself. It's a completely different thing to love others as Christ has loved us. There is no end to the love of Christ. There is no limits to the love of Christ. This is a high bar. The standard is Christ. The call to love is an old commandment. It remains intact, but Jesus raised the bar. This is a call for us as Christians to consider the well-being of others more important than our own. I want you to take a moment and jot this down. I want you to jot down this question, and I want you to, throughout the week, reflect on this. Do this two, three, four, five times this week. Do you consider the well-being of others more important than your own? Do you consider the well-being of others more important than your own? Our love for God is the best test of our saving faith in him. Our love for God's people is a test of our saving faith in Christ. So let me give you a few ways to determine whether or not you're growing in love for other believers. Love can be tough to evaluate. So here's some questions to help you to evaluate yourself. Are you growing in patience and kindness towards others, even when they don't deserve it? It's easy to be patient with people when you feel like they deserve your patience. Are you growing with with patience with people even when they don't deserve it? Are you growing in your desire to spend time with other believers? This should be something that is growing in us, a, a longing and a wanting to spend time in fellowship with other Christians. Are you growing in that? Do you forgive or do you hold a grudge? Do you rejoice when others rejoice, celebrating their victories and successes? I'm, I, I'm going to challenge you on this one. Are you able to rejoice and celebrate other people's successes or does that bring out bitterness in you? This is a real thing. We can really evaluate our heart and our love for one another when we can celebrate other people's successes rather than turning it inwardly and selfishly focusing on ourselves. Well, that's great for them, but what about me? Do you give your time and resources to fellow believers who are in need? Christians obey a new commandment to love. Notice that that this is a commandment, which means it is a choice of the will. Love is a choice of the will. The true mark of a Christian is that they love Christ and love his people. Jesus laid down his life for his disciples. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for the church. That is the standard. Christ loved perfectly, 
He exemplified humility and self-denial and servanthood and sacrifice. Now, we'll never love perfectly, but it should be our goal to love sacrificially, to earnestly desire to follow the example of Christ and grow in love for him and for others. So here's some things to consider as you're examining yourself this week. A loving person builds up others. Are you building up others? A loving person gives credit to others. If you want to know one thing about leadership, one thing about leadership is you take the blame, your team takes the credit. A loving person is selfless, selfless, shows honor to others, is quick to help others, humbly serves, puts others first, values others and what they have to say. Do you listen? Sees the best in people. Is not argumentative. Shows preference to others over self. A loving person hopes for the best for others is truthful, and is forgiving. R.C. Sproul said this, in the New Testament, love is more of a verb than a noun. It has more to do with acting than with feeling. The call to love is not so much a call for a certain state of feeling as it is to a quality of action. Love is a choice of the will. Which takes us to point number three, Christians exemplify love. Close out the the portion here with 9 through 11. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother and abides in the light. And in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Christians exemplify love. In a practical sense, one cannot live in the light if he hates another person at the same time. God's light and hatred are in opposition to one another. Jesus Christ, the light of the world, did not give in to hate even when his enemies hated him. And as image bearers of the light, we are called to reflect the light. We cannot reflect the light if we're filled with hate. We cannot reflect the light of Christ if we're filled with hate. There's a stern warning here about the effects of hatred. Hatred and pride must be dealt with or they will lead to spiritual blindness. One who hates his brother is walking in pride. He is in the darkness. This is sobering because it means he cannot see his own sin means he's not grasping his own need for the gospel and the truth of God's love that has been freely given to him. We cannot think it's okay to hold on to hateful feelings as we pursue the Lord. We must recognize that we do not deserve God's love. And therefore, we cannot withhold love from others on the basis of merit. I'm going to reemphasize that. We must recognize that we do not deserve God's love, and therefore we cannot withhold love from others on the basis of merit. Most of us wouldn't think of ourselves as being uh, hateful, but it's wise to consider whether our thoughts and feelings are actually hateful. Hatred might present itself in these ways. Jealousy, bitterness, seeking revenge, wishing failure for someone, boasting to elevate yourself over others. That's hateful. Looking down on others, being critical of others, spreading lies about people. That's hateful. How about this? Exaggerating the failures of other people. If we exaggerate the failures of other people, that's revealing hate in our hearts. And hate can extend beyond individuals. 
we can grow in hatreds towards a group of people or even the church. Now, I know many in here have been hurt by the church. You may have been hurt by people who claim to be believers within the church. And it's possible you may have been hurt by genuine Christians within the church. My question is this, can you love God but not love the church? There's this thought out there. I can love Jesus, but I don't have to love the bride of Christ, the church. There's this thought that I can be a Christian, I can be a disciple of Christ outside of the church. I can love, the, I can love God and hate the church. There's a serious error in this thinking. John 13, 35. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. He's saying, how will people know that you are my disciples? If you have love for one another. You cannot say you love Christ and not the body of Christ. You cannot say you love Christ and hate the body of Christ. I'm referring to the true church, the invisible church. Love for the church is a defining characteristic of a Christian. Long term, you cannot reject commitment to the church and be a disciple of Christ. John would not have recognized someone as a follower of Christ if he was not a part of the church. A saving faith results in a love for the church. If we don't love the church, there's a reason to doubt our faith. Love is a test of authentic faith. 1 John 4, 8, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. 1 Peter 4, 8, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Christians exemplify love. Someone who loves abides in the light of Christ. Genuine Christians are known by their love. They should not live in hypocrisy, claiming to love Christ while hating the church by hating his people. We love God because God loves us. We are able to love because of the love of Christ. Jonathan Edwards, probably one of my favorite people in all of church history said this, there are people who love those who agree with them and admire them, but they have no time for those who oppose and dislike them. A Christian's love must be universal. This is convicting. This is how God showed love to us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we may have eternal life through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And when this becomes real to us, when this truth penetrates our heart, it changes everything. I have seen it in the lives of people. There are people in here right now who I knew before they came to a saving faith in Christ. When this is real to you, when you understand the gospel, when you understand the love of God, it changes you. We understand that God so loved us that he sent his son to die for us. It moves us to love one another. We can love because Jesus Christ loved us. Close with scripture. John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Church, let's love that way. Let's love sacrificially. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for your word, your word of truth. We're thankful for this high calling of love. We are called to love 
as Christ has loved. God, we know that Jesus was so obedient that his obedience took him to death on the cross. Lord, would that reality be real to us? Would the love of Christ, that he loved us so much that he went to the cross to atone for our sins, would that be so real to us that it changes us, that it transforms us, that we would love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we would love God's people with everything in us sacrificially. Lord, we love you. We trust in the work of your Holy Spirit. We trust in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord.